Uh, today I'm here with Max Hillebrand. Max Hillebrand is a well-known personality on Twitter. He's a Bitcoin maximalist, and he's actually currently living as a crypto nomad. So I wanted to interview him about his crypto nomad lifestyle. Uh, Max, how are you today? Oh, very well, Ricardo. Thanks for asking and thanks for inviting me on the show. I'm excited uh, to be part of uh, building that narrative around living on Bitcoin in the circular economy. Uh, it's fascinating for sure. So you said you're a Bitcoin nomad now. Uh, previously, you were living in Germany. Um, would you care to elaborate about that? Yeah. So, um, you know, I love Bitcoin because Bitcoin is about choice. A choice about what monetary rules you want to adhere by uh, and uh, the choice about what money you want to get paid in ultimately um, and that that thrive for having a free choice is something that uh, is, is very prominent in my entire life and that includes the choice of where i want to be in meat space right where i want to manifest my bodily form uh, and spend my time right and uh, simply I, I will put it if you have more options if there are more choices around uh, then this will lead to a more prosperous outcome right? because if you're currently in a bad situation, uh, like in a bad physical area, well, you don't have to be there, right? You can wake up in some other place tomorrow if you so choose. And and, and that aspect of being free uh, in meat space really uh, was something that I found very compelling at first. And then after living this lifestyle, I really got a confirmation that it is possible uh, not just to survive, but actually to thrive in such an environment. How, how has it been spending Bitcoin in multiple cities and countries? Have you been faced with many obstacles or limitations? Um, no, I think this is where Bitcoin shines the most, right? Because uh, let's imagine if you have a small local fiat currency, I don't know, uh, Swiss francs, right? Uh, but, and now you travel to some other country, Algeria or wherever. Well, they're not even going to know what the Swiss franc is. Right, they they don't have any valuation for that, and you will always have to find some specialized exchange uh, to then trade your Swiss francs uh, to whatever local currency there is. Um, now it's possible, right, because there are these specialized service providers out there, uh, but of course fees and all the hassle involved with that. Plus, you have to do it for every country that you travel, right, and you have to convert when you enter the country and you can convert back uh, when you leave the country because you don't want to be left with a couple hundred dollars of Nigerian currency. Right? Um, so uh, the aspect of, of Bitcoin being this global liquid monetary asset is, is amazing because regardless in what country you go, um, there are people who want to have more Bitcoin, right? They don't, they don't care that you're from a different country. They just want to have this precious magical cyberspace money uh, and that's it, right? So um, I found that it, in basically any country that I that I traveled, there was a decent demand, although small, but enough uh, to cover most of the trading needs that, that I would have ever needed. Uh, and thus, as a global monetary asset, Bitcoin is like a tailor-made fit for a nomads. Yeah, I agree. I interviewed Juan Galt, and he was talking about how there's a gray market in every city around the world for Bitcoin. What's the most Bitcoin-friendly place that you've encountered uh, traveling around as a Bitcoin nomad? Yeah, so there are, I, I would say on a like more larger scale, every country is roughly ish the same. Uh, I mean, Bitcoin adoption is by far not widespread in any region, a large region, I mean. But there are a couple places, smaller areas, where uh, entrepreneurs made an effort to onboard a vast amount of the economy uh, onto the Bitcoin standard. Right, so cities like Roverieto, I butchered that, in Italy, um, for a small, tiny town, but in the, in the town center, everyone demands to be paid in Bitcoin. Right? Uh, that's, that's really fascinating. Um, then I would say that there are a couple of areas that are just kind of hotspots of uh, the Bitcoin and crypto anarchist communities. Uh, Berlin, for example, right, uh, age-old place in technology and especially in Bitcoin development with Room 77, FOMO, like a, a lot of lot of projects come out of just that city alone. Um, Prague is another area, right, with Parallel Nipolis uh, being a pioneer as, an, as a business who only demands to be paid in Bitcoin, no fiat whatsoever since 2013 or something, right? So uh, there, there are a couple of these small pockets uh, that if you're eager enough, you will for sure find them. Last time we spoke, you said that Room 77 had closed. Is it closed because of the pandemic or, or for another reason? Um, no, Jörg Plötzer, the owner, has been running this restaurant for ages, right? And 
Um, you know, working in restaurants is a very hard job. It's not easy at all and tiring, of course, especially if you surround yourself with crazy Bitcoiners right, who stay every night till 5 a.m. talking about the rabbit hole. <laughs> so that can be very challenging for sure. Um, so Eric has made some adjustments over several years now to somewhat reduce um, the, the, the effort or, or like the investment in that project. For example, the kitchen closed uh, two or three years ago, which was a shame because that was the place where like the first burger was bought for Bitcoin, right? Or the first beer was bought for Lightning, right? Uh, there are many nice memories here. Um, and now, specifically with the pandemic, I think Jörg just realized that, hey, in, in, in such a, a government restrictions, it's impossible to run a restaurant. I wanted to reduce it already. Why not move on and do something else? Uh, there were some talks about making a museum out of that place. Uh, which would be fantastic because it's just a place alone has so much history in Bitcoin. It's it's unbelievable and already a nice many nice artifacts are hanging on the walls. Uh, so it, hopefully uh, that that will actually pass. What is merchant adoption like? Uh, have you been able to directly spend Bitcoin in many places, or have you been selling for cash and using gift cards? Yeah. So I I think of course the goal is to directly trade with the entrepreneur Bitcoin for good or service. Uh, I mean, you know, that's what money is all uh, about. Uh, so I, I try that and I, I tried that especially in the past um, with onboarding, especially small merchants, um, family owned and operated businesses. Uh, and there was a decent success, I would say, um, especially on, you know, farms and farmer markets. Uh, was a place where, uh, for some reason, maybe because most farmers are gold bugs and landowners, right? Um, that here the narrative of a sound money used in exchange uh, was very, very compelling. Um, but of course, you know, still difficult to do. And not every entrepreneur will give you the good or service for Bitcoin. And if you really want to have that good or service, well, uh, the only reasonable option is to sell some of your Bitcoin for the fiat fund coupons and then spend them as soon as possible on, on the merchant. Uh, and that is a strategy that uh, I, of course, follow too. Have you been living as a Bitcoin nomad only in Europe or have you also lived on crypto in other regions? I would say mostly Europe, uh, just you know, because that's a really beautiful area actually to travel with lots of diversity and interesting places to see. Um, and a lot of Bitcoin folks, right? So uh, yeah. that's one aspect, uh, but also internationally, yes. Um, and, you know, there, for example, comes to mind one a time where I even bought a flight ticket to Taiwan with Bitcoin, uh, with the Travel by Bit company, uh, which is a great broker for, for airplanes and hotels, um, and uh, then spent there a month to hack on Wasabi with some of the other contributors, which was a great, amazing, productive time. Um, so, so yeah, uh, again, Bitcoin is not limited to any geographical location. I think, of course, Europe is, is one of the more dense areas of Bitcoin activity, same as the United States. Um, but there are Bitcoiners everywhere. You just have to look out for them. What was the level of adoption like in Taiwan? I've, I've heard that Asia has a lot of Bitcoin adoption. Uh, yeah, that's true. I remember there were a couple restaurants uh, and one really nice bar uh, that accepted Bitcoin. Um, uh, there were quite many Bitcoin ATMs, uh, actually, if I remember correctly. Um, but yes, I, I, I didn't really notice any like substantial wow with, oh, so, so many people want their Bitcoin here. Um, but, uh, you know, I guess that will come sooner rather than later. What's a region that you visited in your, in your travels that would benefit the most from embracing Bitcoin adoption? Oh, that's a really good question. But you know, to be honest, I don't think I can hone it down to one single region uh, because uh, you know the problems that Bitcoin solves are international and global, specifically in these recent months uh, in, in the year 2020. Um, there are great statistics on uh, the monetary base increase globally, not by just one currency, but the monetary base of all fiat currencies out there. And that has just increased on a hockey stick curve, right? So we are living in types of hyperinflation. And unfortunately, um, this differs to times of previous hyperinflation in Weimar Republic, uh, Zimbabwe, Venezuela, right, or Turkey, um, because Back then, it was only one small region that, that suffered this, this massive amount of theft. And there was a global economy to kind of catch the slack and, uh, and to be productive in, in total, right? But nowadays, we have this hyperinflation on a global level, uh, which is a very different beast, right? So, um, you know, to be honest, I don't think there is anyone who is uh, safe from not holding any Bitcoin. 
uh, because your local Shaquan is going to be crashing very soon. Where do you plan to travel next in your nomadic journeys? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, that's a good, that's something that I can ask myself every every morning. Uh, like, where do I want to wake up tomorrow? Right? <laughs> uh, and depending on that, I can go many places. Um, I I always like to like to think that I uh, favor traveling to the regions that have good people, right? And and of course, Bitcoiners, uh, whom whom I can work together with. So, I've, and and again, that's global, right? So Budapest is is one nice location just because the Wasabi uh, headquarters are there or your offices, and it's always good to hang around with that team and uh, and build some cool stuff. Um, you know, Croatia is something that I've been kind of curious with. Um, there are some nice islands there, like Kavar and others. Uh, so maybe that. Uh, but, you know, ultimately, uh, I will know as soon as I get in the car and start driving. So you mentioned working on projects like Wasabi. You've worked on a few different Bitcoin projects. How did you get involved with becoming a contributor? Yeah, that that's something that still fascinates me to this day because uh, my background is not at all in free software. Uh, to this day, I'm not a developer, not a coder at all. Uh, I'm a proxyologist, an economist, right, from trade, uh, and uh, th th therefore my, uh, you know, I I understood the the values of of the economics of Bitcoin, but I was still lacking that understanding of why the software actually works and how the software actually does what it does. Um, and I saw this kind of as an opportunity to learn this new area uh, and thus focused on, well, contributing to free software. Uh, but of course, the prominent question, if you don't code, how can you contribute? Right? And in my case, that was especially education. Uh, this is something where uh, I saw there was a, a great lack, um, you know, back in the days where very little content was out there, specifically about some niche projects. Right. Um, you know, so for example, the BISC decentralized exchange, um, there was almost no video, some interviews, some presentations, but not really you no know, concrete guides and, and different viewpoints on how to use it. Uh, so this was one of the many projects that I thought, hey, uh, if, if you know, I help out with educating more and more users, the, the software project will grow. It will be more profitable for everyone who is involved. Uh, that's a zero like that's a net win for everyone. Um, so so why not do that? And then while focusing on that education, I realized that I really want to stay up to date with what's happening on these projects. Um, and so eventually I got my GitHub account uh, and just got notifications for some of the projects that I was interested in. Um, and one of the projects that caught my eye specifically was Hidden Wallet, uh, which was the uh, predecessor of Wasabi Wallet. Um, and I just got fascinated by the concept um, and followed the development really from very early day got close in contact with the contributors who are already working on the code um, and you know, hung out and tried to learn more of the project and saw where problems are that I could fix. Uh, and that was, for example, you know, just bug reports. Uh, that was the very first contributions that I made was like, hey, I'm, I want to run this piece of software. It doesn't work. Please fix it. Right? Super valuable information for developers to, to find bugs right? and to get them reported. Um, or just you know, feature requests. I'm like, hey, it would be really cool if the software could do that. Uh, how about you implement it for me, pretty please? <laughs> uh, and uh, if the feature request is good enough, well, then hopefully someone will pick it up uh, and, and will start uh, developing it. And that kind of led me on this, yeah, on, on, this, on this path of trying to uh, like shape the vision of the softwares that I was using. Um, uh, and the one where I did that probably most is Wasabi Wallet. Um, because it was just something that spoke to me very intuitively and i was like it's already amazing but the potential that i see is so much better let me try everything to to get everyone pulling on the same rope in the right direction right so that we actually achieve these goals um and again because i got all these notifications of who is working on what right? i i understood again what are the skills of some developers if i have a problem what developer should i ask first Right, I like small nuances like this, uh, and that kind of led more in a, let's say, project management role. Um, but so ultimately, to sum it up, how do I contribute? Well, everything but code, uh, I would say. That's really inspiring because I'm not a coder either. What area of Bitcoin development, um, where do you think the most important work is being done to improve Bitcoin right now? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, I mean, you know, the the obvious answer is Bitcoin Core itself. Right. If if the if the base full node infrastructure does not work, well, anything we build on top is useless. Right. Um, but 
like only focusing on Bitcoin Core is not going to cut it either, right? We need we need other uh, even like specifications and other layers are being built. So stuff like Lightning Network, just the protocol side, right? Working on the LND uh, daemon or the uh, Lightning C daemon, uh, C Lightning daemon, and such, very very valuable contributions too. Um, but for me personally, especially as a non-developer, it was always a bit uh, still cumbersome to contribute to these underlying infrastructure projects just because they require such an advanced understanding of the architecture and design. Um, that's even separate from the code itself, right? But I just wasn't there on a computer science theoretical standpoint. So uh, for me personally, I liked to focus on um, user-facing client applications because that's where I saw that I could make the, the most exponential impact, right? Where the, uh, there was a small group of people working on some weird wallet, right? Or some weird decentralized exchange. Um, and it doesn't have all the fame of Bitcoin Core and the other big projects. It has really important potential, though, right? And um, uh, these wallet interfaces also have to be built up. Uh, and I, th I think that's super important. So on the, on the user-facing side, I think the three most vital and important projects uh, are BTC Pay Server for entrepreneurs to demand to get paid in Bitcoin. Incredibly valuable, absolutely essential. Like, I cannot overstate that enough how important uh, something like BTC Pay is right, to get people paid in Bitcoin uh, and do it in a trustless and self sovereign way. Um, then the BISC decentralized exchange. Right? We have hordes of people who only hold fiat and who want to get their hands on Bitcoin. Well, centralized K custodial KYC solutions are no option in a cypherpunk world. Right? So we have to make sure that there is the option of a cypherpunk peer-to-peer uh, -peer exchange as BISC is. Right? So incredibly important uh, project. Uh, and then on, on the wallet side, um, I, specifically the, the privacy aspects are going to be very difficult to improve in Bitcoin on the, uh, on the infrastructure layer. Like we're never going to get ring signatures uh, or, or some weird thing in Bitcoin. That's just too much of an architectural change. But we can improve the privacy exponentially on the wallet level. Uh, and that's why I would suggest Wasabi Wallet as the third most important project. Uh, because it really has done already with Wasabi 1.0 a massive amount of contributions to the Bitcoin privacy space. And with what we're researching and working on now with this next iteration, uh, it's, it's really going to be another exponential increase. Um, and this makes a meaningful impact, right? Um, and we can move reckless, right? And are not tied by consensus, uh, like uh, negotiations as Bitcoin Core is. Um, uh, th that's where it makes the big impact. What is your go-to Bitcoin wallet? I think I know what you're going to answer. And then what is your go-to Lightning wallet? Uh -huh, yeah, yeah um, both good questions. Well, um, you know, I'm, I'm a hidden wallet user by heart and I just love the project. And um, the reason why I st started contributing to Wasabi was because I used it, right? I was a user first, contributor second, and that is to this day. I'd, I would not work on Wasabi if I would not want to use it personally. Uh, and if I don't see any much potential future improvement that my work could do, right? So um, I'm still super bullish on Wasabi and uh, I love it even now, and I think I'm going to love it even more in the future. Um, so yeah, that's my on-chain wallet of choice. Um, with Lightning Network, you know, funnily, it's the Ellen Cly Lightning Network uh, um, uh, command line interface. Um, it, just because of some reason, uh, none of the current uh, user interfaces like work all the time, right? Lightning is still so recklessly early, even after all these years. Um, so because of many transactions just not working out, I want to see everything that's going on. I then I want to see precise error messages and all of this, uh, just so I can try to fix it uh, afterwards or hack around it at least. Um, and for this, the command line interface just is the best. Um, plus, it comes that I run my Lightning nodes on external servers, so not on my laptop, but on on servers uh, on the internet. And there, you just SSH in, right? That's the way that you talk to your to your node uh, in depth. Uh, and their Lightning CLI it just works great. Uh, so, so that's why I use it. What about Wasabi? Will Wasabi ever integrate Lightning or is that um, not in the works? I, I don't think there can be a wallet that does not integrate Lightning um, just because uh, on-chain doesn't scale. And if you want to make transactions, Lightning is the way to go, payment channels. Um, now, um, 
the reason why we did not yet focus on implementing lightning is because it's a behemoth work it's massive like it's it's incredibly huge um and we have a lot of things to do on chain still we want to focus on on-chain privacy first because that's what matters right if you don't have on-chain privacy well your lightning network privacy is going to be substantially reduced right um so first we got to figure out on-chain privacy and i think with the wabi sabi coin john algorithm we're having a, a very solid fundamental uh, well, protocol that we can build on top of. So somewhat of the next uh, big task, kind of Wasabi Wallet 3.0, is some form of a Lightning Network integration. But I'm saying some form because, again, Wasabi is a privacy-first project. So we are not happy with the current design of the uh, Lightning Network in terms of privacy. Um, there, there are quite many privacy flaws um, that can be substantially improved, right? It's, it's not broken. It's just a bit ugly, and we can make it better. I, Schnorr will do wonders and Taproot uh, or, you know, even other soft forks uh, will improve privacy on a, on the protocol level. But even the client side application uh, has um, or has many potential improvements that can be that can be done. Um, so I'm very sure that we will have uh, lightning in Wasabi. It will probably be not as we see it in today's lightning network. I think we might use some more privacy preserving payment channel techniques. Uh, so, for example, atomic asynchronous locks. Uh, there are some other more advanced research papers that improve the privacy of, of, of channels substantially. Um, and, you know, some nuances with, uh, you know, private channels, public channels. There are a lot of small details that have to be worked on in order to have a private, a privacy-focused Lightning Network implementation. Um, and that's big work. So, unfortunately, I don't see it happening anytime soon. Uh, but it's for sure something that we have in mind and that we have in mind now when designing the Wabi Sabi coin join algorithm so that hopefully in the future, when we get to Lightning, we can have like channel openings inside a massive coin join transaction, right? Uh, directly funding channel factories or, uh, you know, other group type payment channels um, that provide substantial high an anonymity set for every Lightning transaction then that follows. Um, there's a lot of a lot of cool things that we can do, huge amount of work. Uh, and no time. <laughs> that kind of leads me into my next question. You mentioned Schnorr signatures and Taproot. Uh, what are your thoughts about the Taproot soft fork that's being proposed right now? Well, Taproot itself as a technology, as a concept, is is beautiful. Um, it, it realizes that um, you can have very complex scripts, many complex spending conditions uh, of who can uh, sp spend this Bitcoin. Um, but in the cooperative case, where everyone agrees, um, these spending conditions are, are not revealed. Uh, they are not used. Right? Uh, there, are, there are other cool twerks, like, for example, a multi-signature all of a sudden looking like a single signature, right? or a hashed time lock contract, which is used in Lightning Network, all of a sudden lo also looking like a public key and a signature with point time lock contracts. Um, there, again, Taproot is a massive improvement on the privacy level of Lightning, for example. And I think everyone agrees with that point. I don't hear any serious conceptual flaws with Taproot. Um, you know, other maybe than some small trade-offs. Uh, I think there's an all-around rough consensus to to use Taproot. And now the current question is, how do we get it activated? Right? That's a whole other uh, issue, and that's uh, well a bit of a drama. Um, it's incredibly difficult to upgrade the Bitcoin protocol. That's a feature, not a bug. Right? We don't want anyone to forcefully upgrade 21 million to an infinite amount of Bitcoin. Right? <laughs> that would be very horrible. Uh, so we have to take care that. Even though now Taproot is a feature that basically everyone wants, that it's still not trivial to actually make that change, right? That it still has to be honed down and coordinated finally and with very, very broad user uh, awareness and user support. Um, I th that gives me a lot of confidence about the security of Bitcoin uh, and its rule sets. Um, but of course, it's kind of annoying, right? Because I would have loved to start building you know, a Lightning wallet on Taproot two years ago or something. Uh, but well, good, takes, good things take time. We've seen governments kind of in panic mode right now, uh, dealing with Bitcoin. Um, what do you think the impact of a central bank digital currency like a crypto euro or a crypto dollar is going to have on Bitcoin? Do you see it as a threat or it's just inferior money? I see it as a very serious threat for, for banks, um, actually. Be uh, and funnily, as a massive opportunity for, for individuals, um, because one important note, right? So I talked earlier about base money. Uh, what is base money? Right? Base money is basically the gold atom, right? Uh, it's, if you have a gold coin in your hand, that's base money. It's the money itself, uh, M0, right? 
and then there are M1, M2, M3, and these are claims on money, right? So you give that gold coin to a bank, now you get a paper note back that says, uh, if you give this paper note back to the bank, they will give you the gold coin. That's a claim on money, right? It's no longer a monetary base. Now, in Bitcoin, we have base money, right? If you hold one Bitcoin, that's one Bitcoin. Nobody owes you one Bitcoin. There is no claim on that one Bitcoin, right? It's just yours. So in the fiat realm, what is this base money? Uh, and it's quite interesting, but it's actually the physical cash, like the actual paper bills and coins, as well as the reserves um, uh, held at the central bank. Uh, so basically the debt that the central bank issues, um, uh, or uh, sorry, buys. Um, now, the interesting thing is that you as an individual person can hold cash as base money, right? But you cannot hold an account at a central reserve, right? Nobody is, is going to listen to you and give you a personal account, right? Only governments and banks have these central bank accounts, right? Uh, and therefore can hold base money in digital form. Um, and everyday users have an account at the bank, but that's not base money. That's M3, right? That's some leveraged claim that where thousands of other people have the claim on the same money. Right? So it's it's a very, well, I would say, fraudulent system. Um, but the interesting thing with digital bank uh, currencies is that these are base money. Um, if you hold a digital bank, a digital bank coin, you uh, it, it is it is a it is the thing in and of itself. It is not a claim on the thing. It's the thing itself. Right? It's a gold coin. Uh, it's the Bitcoin, basically. It's the base money, not a claim on base money. So that is economically speaking a very revolutionary change in the fiat infrastructure. And it will have very interesting and, and complex and nuanced um, uh, like uh, outcomes or, or consequences. And I think the, the most broadly speaking is that it will be much more manageable to fine tune the money printing. Right Now the central bank can say, well, okay, we're going to print base money and we're going to give it exactly to, to Ricardo here. Right? Um, that so far was very was more difficult in the incumbent financial system um, with with these M two and one M two M three, so that's going to be interesting, uh, but it doesn't change the value proposition of Bitcoin. Right? Uh, Bitcoin is base money without a trusted third a third party. Um, the central bank coins are base money with the trust in the central bank, of course, right? And they can print as much as they want. Um, so. You know, it it does change things in the fiat world. Um, arguably, it makes them better. Maybe it makes them actually worse. Um, but it's still so far off from being any competitor to Bitcoin because Bitcoin's value proposition is infinitely more substantial uh, than that of fiat shitcoins. How would you characterize your personal Bitcoin moon? Like right now with the bull market, we've heard people, you know, cashing out and buying their first home or paying off their mom's mortgage or something like that. Uh, what What is Max Hillebrand's personal moon? Uh, well, I think it's all the time. <laughs> like if you, if you define the personal moon as, as when I'm when I'm like spending my Bitcoin, well, like almost always, right? Like I like to eat, <laughs> you know, I like to have shelter. I, I, I do like to wear clothes, right? So I, I do need to eat uh, and, and spend my Bitcoin, um, especially so as an entrepreneur, right? I got to pay people, right? I, I want them to get shit done. Um, and uh, plus, uh, or so this means that I'm spending my Bitcoin frequently. Yes. Uh, at any price level, right? I don't care if, if the Bitcoin value is high or low, I got to pay my suppliers. Right. Um, the but but sure, my time preference is affected by the price. Right. Obviously, because my hoard of Bitcoin is worth more or less. Um, so, yeah, it, it does feel kind of nice to, you know, uh, to treat yourself to something that you probably you know, might not have bought. Um, but now that your holdings are worth substantially more. Well, yeah. OK, maybe treat yourself to that. Um, but, you know, ultimately or where, where I see the downside of this is, again, I'm an entrepreneur, I want to earn more Bitcoin, right? So when the Bitcoin price goes up, it's much more difficult to actually earn the Bitcoin, right? Because people like them more and they hold on to them more. Um, uh, so it, like my personal moon is somewhat when, well, 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 for one, when, you know, more people actually earn Bitcoin, right? When, when they continuously get paid in Bitcoin, um, that's like for me a substantial uh, achievement uh, worth celebrating. Um, but also then if people actually pay their contractors, right? Again, talking about the circular economy, that is my personal moon, right? Living in such a such an agora, uh, such a marketplace where, where free people trade with Bitcoin, right? And, and hold their wealth in Bitcoin and measure their prices in Bitcoin. 
uh, that is for me kind of the the end goal uh, why I'm in it, uh, and we're on a good track. Uh, I, I see it with me personally. Um, I live in a full circular Bitcoin economy on my micro level, right? I just hope that I can onboard, you know, the rest of the world uh, to create this macro economy uh, based on the Bitcoin standard. Awesome. That was a wonderfully insightful answer, Max. Thank you very much for taking the time to answer my questions and doing the interview. Um, I really enjoyed speaking to you. This was actually one of the most interesting uh, Bitcoin conversations I've had in a while. So uh, thanks for that. Well, I'm very happy, but you see that that shows the good questions that you ask. Uh, so, <laughs> so yeah, thanks for, for being prepared and having the, the right questions uh, to, enha to enhance a, a good conversation. Uh, was great being on. Uh, again, I, I, I love what you guys at BitRefill are doing. Uh, you're, you're really a substantial mover, um, not just in the narrative of the circular economy, but actually making it happen right with these gift cards. Um, super, super important. Uh, it, it helps close that loop much sooner than it otherwise would have been. Uh, and and that's such a valuable service. So I, I can't thank you, uh, you guys enough for, for building this and, and for making it possible for more people to live on Bitcoin.